The following program contains scenes of a graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. This is my breakfast. It's a weird concoction. It's not that complicated, but it's a soy milk, the Chinese uh, tofu type drink um, that I put in a blender with uh, cinnamon and ginger, about a teaspoonful of each. <clears throat> it's a very spicy breakfast to have, um, but um, I'm not really much of a breakfast kind of person, uh, but breakfast, they do say, is the best or the most important meal of the day. So um, on the advice of they, hearsay, I suppose, I've never really researched it, I consume a breakfast, and this is it. You can start to like the taste of anything after a while. Um, why did I just do what I just did? What's the purpose? Is there a purpose? Why do any of us consume anything? Why do living organisms consume things? Um, well, there's uh, that's back to the old value judgment again, isn't it? Why does anyone ever do anything? Well, I think that consumption is pretty much just another action, another thing that human beings or sentient beings or beings in particular just do. But I have to point out that we're not the only ones that consume things. Um, lighting my face this morning is the sun. The sun's consuming itself and it's giving me light in return. Does it really understand what it's doing? Is there a why up there for the sun? to consume itself and create light for the rest of us? Does it even care that we're here? No, I doubt it. I don't think it has anything against us, and I don't think it has anything for us. I don't think that, uh, I think that the sun just does it. Which is the same thing as I do when I empty this glass of weird, um, weird science project every morning. I, uh, I'm simply doing something because it's easier to do that than to not do something. Whatever value we place on that is our value alone. Some people say that it's terrible that we have to eat. Uh, people throughout uh, time have noted the fact that if we don't do that, uh, all kinds of problems uh, appear. Some of us, a very tiny minority, deliberately refuse to consume anything else to the point of death. Um, very small minority of people, but some people do because they see the horror of existence is an addiction or uh, an overattachment to everything, including food and in, even in oxygen and everything that we have to uh, bring into ourselves in order to maintain our existence. Some people think that that's just an eternal weariness. The book of Genesis implies this. We were in the Garden of Eden where we used to go around and have whatever kind of fruit that we wanted and next thing you know we have to sweat all day long in the hot sun to grow stuff just to put food in our bellies. That is our horror of existence. Why do we do that? Again, I think that, again like I point out in, uh, in the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, we do it simply because it's easier than doing nothing. We can consciously do nothing if we want, but since most of us are practical people and we tend to take the easiest route to anything, um, we think that, well, rather than um, rebel against the reality that I have to consume things in order to go on existing, and since I really do want to go on existing for reasons that I don't quite understand, but there's some strong built-in sense that I don't want to die, that I don't quite understand, but I know death is inevitable, it's a weird conundrum, hence the despondency of Arjuna. Um, oh well, I'll drink that concoction. It's just, it's a lot easier than trying to deal with the metaphysical and existential implications of not doing it, or why I do it. It's just an easier thing to do. It's neither good nor bad. It's not, it's not something disgusting when you see a bunch of hyenas ripping apart 
carry and are vultures. Um, it's not disgusting to them. They're just doing what comes naturally to them. And I'm not saying that it's good or bad. It just is. Vultures do that. Vultures eat carrion. A lot of lizards can only eat things if it's actually in the state of decomposition. And the more advanced, the better. Humans are, in a, in a sense, kind of like that. You've ever, you know, had a glass of wine or a dish of jugged hair or a piece of cheese, and you know what I mean. Um, what value do we place on this? Is it terrible? What value do we place on um, the scenes that we see of people starving to death in other countries? My ancestors, um, a great number of them, probably my distant relatives from long ago, starved to death in Ireland during the Great Famine, and then a lot of them probably died of cholera, and they died namelessly, because after um, about 140 years, my family tree disappears, because everybody was illiterate, and the huge amount of dislocation that, um, that uh, accompanied the Great Famine that saw my ancestors come to uh, North America from Ireland, uh, so many people died off, so many people became separate, that I just don't know. Oh well, I've <laughs> I know that I'm here, and that's really all that's important to me. That was a tragedy of mind-blowing proportions. The Great Famine. The famines continue to happen. There was one during the Second World War in, um, in India. There was one uh, in China in the 1950s. Uh, the Ethiopian one. Uh, there's all kinds of famines that take place. And they are terrible things for the people that are involved in them. But we've got to remember the the food itself that these human beings run out of doesn't deliberately make itself scarce. There's no intent here. It's There's no more intent in a famine, unless of course you're dealing with one of these artificially created famines like we saw in the 20th century, but that's again something completely different. But I'm talking about an actual economic crisis where there's not enough to eat. Famines no more visit themselves on people or on sentient beings, then the sun deliberately visits its light upon my face. It's just something that happens. It creates situations for those who don't want it to happen that are pretty undesirable and pretty uncomfortable and horrific even. But it's not something that deliberately happens. Whatever value judgment we place on it is a bias. We don't like famines because the flesh disappears from our bones, our bellies feel terrible, we hallucinate, um, our organs fail, we become prey to all kinds of terrible diseases, people resort to terrible things or things that we think are terrible, like cannibalism. Um, you watch your children, your relatives die in front of your face. It's a, it's a very, very traumatizing thing to go through. That's why we fear famines. But the famine itself isn't deliberate. It's just, unless of course, again, it is one of those deliberate famines, but most famines are economic crises. Supply and demand have become imbalanced. Um, suddenly there's uh, more demand than there is supply, and there's going to be a shortage. Um, dreadful as, though that, as that sounds, that's just the way the world is. It's not as though there's some god up there, which people often do blame these things on gods, who, have, who has been angered and who says, I'm going to reduce your numbers and punish you. That's the idea of intent. Um, and I don't think that people understand fully um, what intent actually implies. Malign intent. Um, if, uh, if there is an actual intent to famines, yes, I can understand how we would think that they actually are, by their very nature, horrific, because somebody is deliberately doing it. But if it's, an, if it's a famine based upon some sort of shortage or a natural calamity, it's just something that happens. It's not um, some sort of evidence that existence is horrible, um, any more than, again, the, uh, uh, any other natural phenomenon is in and of itself horrible. It's just something that's happening. <clears throat> now, I consumed that gunk this morning simply because I consume it every morning because I'm not a breakfast person. But I do like my lunch. I really do. That's when I like to make kind of a big deal out of it, um, where I have a proper uh, spread of food and everything. I would have done well in a lot of Mediterranean countries because that's when I really like to sit down and eat. 
preferably with a nap or at least some sort of mild recreation afterwards. Anyone who's ever visited Paris for the first time from an Anglo country, or anywhere in France or Italy, I suppose, <clears throat> will note with either condescension or envy the difference between the way we eat and the way, say, the French eat. The French, sometimes the French are just as hurried as anyone else and they'll stuff something down their throat and move on with their life, but if they have a chance, they will sit down, no matter how simple the fare, they'll take their time, consider every mouthful, at least compared to us, um, and you can tell. I actually saw a guy doing that the first time I ever went to Paris, and it still sticks with me. Uh, a fellow was eating a simple dish of sausage and lentils, and he had a half liter of rosé wine. I was well, I was there with my brother and my father, and we kind of were amazed at this fellow taking his sweet time. And he was sitting alone, which is something that French Canadians don't like to do. They like to have about ten other people around them while they're eating. But this fellow, I guess it was him and his meal and his uh, little bit of wine. And he was getting an enormous amount of satisfaction out of it. It wasn't just something he was doing to keep his body going. Um... He was actually, this was a positive, um, again, this might be some projection, but it looked to me like a positive experience for him. He wasn't simply fulfilling a need. He was actually taking a need and turning it into a virtue, turning it into a positive good, because he was treating this little simple meal as an experience worthy of note, and he probably did this every day. I hope that he didn't notice that we were kind of staring at him and talking about what he was doing. He was far enough away that he probably didn't know. Um, but uh, we were, in in a way, we were admiring him. We were noticing the, the cultural differences between English speakers and um, people of certain other cultures. Ask him what that meal meant to him. He's probably eaten that way all of his life, so he doesn't even consider it. But um, that meal, if you ask me, means a great deal more to him than my simple pile of gunk that I pour down my throat every day. To him, it's not just filling his belly. To him, it's an actual positive experience. That's why I think that consumption is a multifaceted thing. It's something that we don't fully understand ourselves, and especially if we take a purely scientific view of it, i.e., we eat or die, and that's just the way it is, we overlook so much. We overlook the fact that we have the option of not eating, and some people actually avail themselves of that option. And we also have the option of turning um, a necessity, a biological necessity, into something that is a positive good, a positive, uh, on my graph, that French fellow's meal of lentils, sausages, and rosé wine was on the plus side of, of uh, the graph that I uh, usually refer to. He was just fulfilling a biological need. There's no denying that. But he was doing something a lot more than that when he sat down and ate his meal with quiet satisfaction. Consumption? Yes, we need to do it. But we also like to do it. Thank you.